Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you very much to the Cambridge uh, uh, IL Exchange for inviting me. Uh, I've, be, I've been part of the audience in the last two uh, meetings and I thoroughly enjoy it. So, I hope that today you uh, uh, find the um, the presentation interesting and most of all that you have a good time because it's almost almost the weekend okay as far as said uh, i have three polls nothing very hard i assure you okay so hopefully just the nice mix between no, uh, so you don't fall asleep okay so let me uh, click here okay so thank you Farah for that lovely introduction and as uh, mentioned in my bio I've worked I've been working in in software for more than than 20 years in several positions always in services uh, and uh, I've also spearheaded several initiatives for furthering diversity and inclusion in tech I've Originally Spanish, but I, and I've now li I I've been living in UK for more than 16 years. But I also lived in Venezuela, Canada, Greece, and France. So you will think that when I launched my personal website in 2018 to uh, actually share with the world my passion about diversity and inclusion and why technology actually can accelerate diversity and inclusion you will kind of said, you know, that should really be very easy to accomplish. Actually, I was, you know, to put your, some context, of course, you know, that was a very important moment for me because as, uh, uh, before that, all my work had been uh, at uh, the company I work for. So, but uh, after uh, I launched it around May, 2018, and about November 2018, I met somebody in a virtual uh, course that she is actually a specialist in uh, um, physical disability. So, of course, I share with her my website, and she sends me the following email. Patricia looks great, and I just wonder if your site is accessible. Check this website. So I'm like accessible. So I, I click uh, the link and it takes me to actually the uh, 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 a blog called uh, a blind uh, girl blog, where in the post, the author says how she loves to actually read other people's blogs, but unfortunately we keep blocking her out because as she's blind, she cannot use her screen reader. Then after that, she lists 10 very easy ways in how we can make the site accessible. For me, I can, I can tell you, I, I remember it now and I still swallow very hard because to me that basically awoke me at, to the reality. One thing was my intent to, you know, propagate, evangelize about diversity and inclusion, another the impact. At least I was barring the door to my website to almost 300 million people in the world. After that, uh, uh, about four months later, I actually stumbled into a book, uh, very famous, about how um, uh, to uh, use behavioral science to improve the, uh, the appeal of the technical products. And there, the, it was very interesting because actually it was the first time I could see a chapter about ethics. But what interested me was that the author said, you know, actually ethics is not so complicated. If you are a developer, you create your product and you know, it, it doesn't harm you and you don't want to, you know, and the aim of the product is not to harm people, it's good. You are well, uh, good to go. And that really shocked me. 
I thought, come on, really? Intent is not impact. And what's more, what I realized is that it, went, it was going deeper because that meant that purpose is not equal to legacy. So I'm now curious actually about you. This is, uh, as uh, mentioned, a poll. And I would love if you can go, you can use here as well your, um, uh, well, uh, you can go to the, um, uh, to Slido and hopefully, what? OK. Oh. Sorry. So we have last month. OK, we have one person. <laughs> Maybe let's see. Oh, six months. OK, it's coming. Never. Fantastic. OK, OK, OK. I will give it just a little bit more and we can revisit them. But I think that it's it's quite telling, you know, that how at, for some, you know, some of us being rejected is the norm. And I can tell because my name is quite long because of the Spanish origin. And I keep chopping and chopping. And actually my name, Patricia Gestoso, is like 40% of my actual name. So thank you very much. You know, I think that actually, you know, uh, it, um, it tells a story that I'm not alone and uh, being rejected, but actually rejecting as well, <laughs> people. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. So uh, we can see that 44% of you actually, so more than uh, uh, half of you actually had been rejected by a product of services within the last six months, which is quite a lot compared to uh, other times where I've run this. So uh, hopefully, okay. So this is the agenda for today. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just I'm playing a little bit with the uh, with the, the Zoom. Um, so for the um, uh, so uh, the agenda for today actually is is quickly. So we will start first. Um, can you see my, sorry, can you see my skin okay? Because it, it gives me the impression that I'm doing something wrong, maybe. It's giving a little orange box near yeah, the top but, of the screen. Okay, it's interesting. Yeah. It appears and disappears. I'm sorry about that. I don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, oh. Okay, I apologize, I think, uh, but hopefully it won't be so bad, okay? Um, so this is the agenda for today. We will start first looking at those beliefs that keep us to actually uh, get into better places, workplaces, as well as product and services. And we will have a look at what the little monsters we have created with those beliefs. Then. I'll share with you some of the ideas I, I think, you know, actually prompt us to look further and to a brighter future. However, it's not easy. And, you know, you may think, you know, this is, you know, uh, a, um, a session that is going to, you know, come a little bit like, wow, we talk about all this, but really it's not realistic. I want to reassure you that hopefully at the end of the talk, we will be like this very nice fish. I'm a diver, you know, when I can. So, <laughs> so and, you know, uh, I'll share with you some tools um, to hopefully, you know, uh, try to, to do some change in, uh, you know, in our environment. Okay, so um, Let's start with the limiting beliefs we have, or what I say, the scarcity mindset. So the first one is what we 
Okay. Is there a window on top um, that no, you could move out the way? No, this no. is the thing. I'm, I'm re uh, it's, it's really weird because it doesn't, you know, it appears there, but actually there is nothing. And disappears well. alone. Okay, you know. no, never mind. Okay, <laughs> no matter, we can see. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, the, the, first, the first thing is about work. And uh, actually, uh, the, it's about work. And we do have this year, it has shown us that, you know, the last year, that actually, um, uh, you know, that belief we had about not being able to work from home was that a limiting belief, but it's not the only one. Actually, one at the core is what we believe is work. And that is more than 200 years old when Adam Smith actually told us that, you know, work is actually linked to self-interest and then is the reason why we need to pay for labor. However, if it's not only self-interest, like for example, caring for your family, then is not work. And these have survived 250 years where we can see that, for example, we, um, uh, all the raise on unpaid uh, work and the effect on women and, care and carers. Um, and even if you go to the uh, International Labor Organization, you will see that people that care for their family are considered inactive economically, okay? So, but we have more uh, self-limiting uh, beliefs and one and other is about the 40 hours. We, Henry Fall decided a century ago that full -time, uh, a full-time job was 40 hours a week. And we have gone to the moon and back and still, that is the standard. If we you, you work less, then you actually give the impression that you are not committed. So again, a lot of work to do. Uh, the next one is intelligence. And that comes from the 17th century and ras uh, rationalism and Descartes and his idea that comes from the Greeks about uh, uh, the human being as the only uh, human, uh, the only animal that is rational, actually, and all this idea that we need to follow the logic. Of course, in this idea of intelligence, which is extremely narrow, not everybody has in the same uh, in the same amount, and there are a specific gender and a specific uh, skin color that appears to have more intelligence. And all that actually has built what we call a meritocratic system, where we think that some people that have some kind of intelligence are actually superior. And what is more, in uh, that belief makes uh, to think that actually we are in the uh, in the planet as a masters and not as a contributors because guess what the na nature doesn't have any intelligence the next one is our place for e efficiency that comes from all the theory about scientific management okay there is Basically, when we talk about, about work, there is no task that cannot be chopped and, max, and, and then minimize the time it takes and being more efficient. And we keep working exactly on the same mechanics about efficiency, and which actually what makes is that we are so focused on efficiency that we don't have actually any slack to do innovation. The next one <clears throat> is, act is uh, actually the stereotyping. Uh, we talk a lot about the stereotypes when we discuss um, unconscious bias. But actually, 
there is a, a longer story about that. If you, uh, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, there was actually a, a lot of, uh, the, um, I would say the relationship between makers as and clients or customers was really uh, very personal. Okay, there was not the standard customer. Okay, there was a, that one-to-one -one exchange. Industrial revolution changed that uh, uh, that relationship uh, dramatically, and now what we are actually uh, looking at is at really these stereotypes of what a user is. We want to have to create uh, products for 7 mil, uh, billion people, but actually use maybe four categories, what that we call personas. But not only that, it also takes us to the ideal worker, to think that there is only one kind of employee. And this is how we design our offices, that is how we design work. That is how we design the, um, basically uh, our ecosystem. So the other one is growth. And we, uh, in, in this, and then in 1960s, uh, we did, uh, we have, the appearance of all, all this theory uh, from Rosto about the idea that in a perfect society where uh, governments don't mess up, actually everything should grow and grow and grow. But, you know, is this a realistic expectation? Actually, uh, what if a school will tell us they aim for infinite growth or a hospital or even the government. So it could appear that we really treat business in a very different way than any other thing that is, is as well very, very important. And let's be transparent. The only th the, 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 the things that grow uh, forever are things like cancer or, you know, parasites. So the other thing is actually our obsession with leadership. When you look at the at, at history books, yes, you have some faces. But actually, when we see really the deep changes in society, that those are not leaders are actually have been driven by communities of people. Okay, and we are more and more going to, to a society when we handpick people and we expect them to do things and accomplish, accomplish things in, um, uh, in name of the community. And finally, the this belief, uh, it's really very dear to me, and is the tech exceptionalism. What I mean with that, if, I, if you remember, around 2014, uh, Zuckerberg, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, said that Facebook was actually changing their motto that used to be uh, move fast and break things. So now was going something like move fast, but you know, with this, uh, with a stability or things like that. But actually, that has endured and it still endures because we treat tech products like experiments to learn. But actually, if you look closely, we don't do anything like that for other industries. Look at COVID. We just don't say, let's go and experiment with the population, the vaccine, or the chemical industries, or the food industries. Actually, we have a lot of regulations. So uh, this is what I mean when I refer that we treat tech like it doesn't need regulation, like it's special. So I'm now curious to see if uh, 
if those limited, this is the next poll, the second one of three. I'm curious to see if uh, you, um, which ones resonate with you. Okay, uh, and in the, in the meantime, I'm gonna try to, <laughs> No, there is no way it doesn't. So if you can uh, please answer the, the poll, that would be fantastic. I might need to reactivate the poll there. Oh, there yeah. Let's come back. Let's come back. It's all right. Uh, maybe while we're answering the poll, you might unshare and then reshare your screen. Yeah, I, uh, it's, okay. Let's see. Let's see if that works better. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's really fun. <laughs> okay. Efficiency, intelligence, growth. Okay. I have six. I think, thank you, Farah, because I think that made the trick, actually. You know, something you can always learn something from those. From I think from you've these. still got a bit of a uh, half an hour. Oh. I don't know if that's left over, but anyway, it's okay. I think okay. That's, uh... okay, because as I said, uh, yeah, let's not worry about it. I'm sure it's going to be fine. Okay, oh. okay, I have to say, oh. My apologies. It's like you can definitively, there are things you cannot control. <laughs> um, okay, so let me, I don't think he li it, it likes actually the, um, somehow there is something there. Is, that it is, the, um, is it the chat window of the, um, of the Zoom? Cool. Maybe that might be it. This keeps coming up in f over it. Oh, okay. Maybe maybe th there is a way to remove it. An X in the corner. So if you if you if you've got the 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 window open with where everyone's writing the text, that might be. It seems that there's a window over the top of it, and that's why we're getting to see it. But okay. I, I, but I don't know. I know. No. Because uh, I, I I don't have that. Oh. I think maybe we can just we can continue. We could read the text. So okay, if that's a... okay. 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 Oh. It doesn't. Okay. So uh, thank you very much to the 10 of you that, um, that replies. So efficiency, stereotyping and growth, you know, appear to resonate quite a lot with you. So, uh, in summary, so basically this is how success looks like, okay? I think you recognize who is there. That is very, very big. And then, when they ha then we have the returns for the society, taxes, philanthropy, or um, corporate responsibility. So, in words, how that looks like, 
so basically, as uh, as uh, as um, the uh, business grow, we have that we have an increase on talking about purpose, productivity, efficiency, standardization. But actually, what we see is as they grow, we look less at the real impact. The time to show ROI is really get shorter and shorter, less authenticity, accountability, and also is, as I said, it's all about purpose, but not necessarily about legacy. So I think it's may, maybe this lead of, uh, that is, is playing around. So base, the other very important thing is the creation of silos. I've been uh, actually uh, led uh, a couple of uh, acquisitions integrations. And what you see is actually naturally the formation of silos. And, and there are three main of them. One is the people, the internal silo, which is actually, if you want, overlooked by HR, which with the mission to mitigate issues. Then R&D is asked to focus on new users and to appeal those that are not yet our clients. And because uh, customers are look after services with are left actually with the, uh, managing that relationship, the gap between their expectations and what they get into the, um, uh, they, they get uh, as a product or service. But it's not the only way. Actually, I will share with you a couple of examples that show that there is another way to work. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Alchemist cocktail bar. They actually, when they had two bars, they had all these lofty ideas of, um, in, you know, incredible growth. But actually, they got a lot of pushback from investors because they have a huge, huge turnaround uh, uh, of. Um, of staff and the reasons and and really they 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 weren't able to get any backup so that forced them to actually look at their staff and understand what was going on actually what they had is uh, their staff were mainly generation said that will you will uh, use that as a, as a gig but they they were not really learning a lot. So the moment they learned a couple of things and they got some money and found something else, they would just go to the next thing. So they actually engage and focus inside and, and park for a moment the, the growth and then realize that they needed for, the, for the, the staff was at the core and that they need to nurture it. They needed to understand what the alchemist was playing, the role it was playing in their life, train them and also actually get feedback from them. And that actually uh, uh, worked fantastically for them. They have, a, a, you know, multiplied the number of bars they had, but actually that stuff was really committed um, uh, not only uh, drove into innovation in their practices, but also they were now the al alchemists. They really are uh, very, uh, they have plenty of programs around electricity management, you know, uh, save electricity, water, and so on. So it is possible to change and change pays off. Um, the second example is uh, with an e-traveling company. And I've come to this issue several times in my life when talking with um, uh, companies that actually know electronic traveling. And most of them I've met, uh, the exec team are millennials and their staff is millennials, uh, is composed of millennials and um, uh, uh, Gen Z. And they think that the, uh, if they, they create the products that they like, everybody 
will actually love them as well. So I, uh, in this case, I met one person that she used to be the chief officer, uh, people officer, and she told me that during years, she tried to convince them actually to hire people of different generations and there was no way because the idea was that oh you know old people don't learn new tricks and she actually had to put you she built a case a business case to show them actually that gen x as well as uh, boomers uh, travel as well, but they do it differently. And actually for that was a turning point for them in, uh, you know, in their growth. So it is possible to, to change and there is value, but what we've seen is that really needs to be a specific. There is no, usually people that just have this, you know, embrace the idea of diversity and inclusion. Actually, it goes very much into building the specific case. So as I said here, that really changed, uh, you know, the, their, their business model. So how we go from this scarcity mindset to the abundance mindset. So I saw, that the other speakers uh, share their books. So I don't agree with 100% of all of them, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a mixture that hopefully will you know, prompt you know, uh, to think in a different way. So the strategy is basically there are no magic bullets. That's the reality. There is no one thing, there is no one program that is really going and, and, and really change the, our workplace or the products and services we create uh, in a world. And the way to do it is not through recipes. I, more and more there is content about the thing, things you're going to change, the 10 things. The, uh, uh, you know, it's like the to-do list, but really those general re recipes don't work. And it's a lot more useful to, uh, uh, to actually follow frameworks, which allow to, to teams and to companies to actually create their recipes. Okay, so unfortunately, there are no sh sh uh, shortcuts. You, we need to do the work. Uh, but again, frameworks allow us to do it systematically. So the first principle, um, and I am very conscious <laughs> that I'm talking to people working in, in software, is that, you know, we focus so much in the narrow solution to the narrow problem, trying to get the product market fit, like was just only a discussion between the business and customers and, and, and somewhere there, the investors. But actually this is rather than trying to get this one product market fit, what if we recast this actually as contribution? If us as a business, we could say, how we contribute actually to our, the life of our customers, to the life of our employees. Also to enlarge that and said, what about our communities? You know, the, uh, those communities where our customers and co-creators live and why not the government? And of course, the planet. So if we instead, instead of focusing on the one problem and the one solution, we, we talk about contribution, then we are getting less, we are talking less about, about purpose and we are really getting more into legacy. The other thing is to embrace diversity. Diversity is there. You know, we, we can close our eyes, we can think that the 7 billion people in the planet are like us, but that's not true. And what is more, when we see uh, top innovations in the world, like, you know, internet, actually, it, uh, the, the seed 
is to cater for a small population. In that case, you know, with, with population uh, that is uh, that uh, is deaf. So, I think we again that comes to it is a a, chain, uh, a a mindset change, and we either embrace it as a positive, or or uh, you know, it is a, it becomes a, a limiting belief. The other thing is that. We talk about business model, like business model is at the core of companies. As I said, I've participated in several mergers and acquisitions, and all of them have reassured me that at the core, the hardware of a co company is really their workforce. Okay, this is what is irreplaceable. And after that is the work culture. Because I've seen companies and large companies changing the business model from one year to the other. But work culture, which is not only talking about purpose, but it's about behaviors and the taboos, that takes years to change. So focusing in workforce and work culture should be our priority. And then we can look at the business model. And the other thing I want to float around, uh, uh, I, don't, I won't go into all the details, is to look at croquetos differently. I think we, we focus so much in, in thinking that the person that creates or develops, for example, a piece of software is only the developer. Actually, I, I do believe that the suppliers, the contractors, and in some cases, even competitors could actually create an ecosystem that fosters innovation. And I will give you an example. Uh, last year, with other diversity and inclusion allies from competitors of like Siemens and IBM, we created a partnership to discuss actually how we could advance diversity and inclusion in tech. So, we are competitors when we talk about you know plm and, and so on but it's still there is you know there is value into co-creating other uh, other programs and collaborating so my last poll uh, i um I, I'm very interested. You, we have talked about creating ethical inclusive experiences. What, you, what do you think, from your point of view, what are the main challenges that you see in, in your business unit or in your company that actually prevent the creation of ethical and inclusion experiences? It is money, it is time, it's expertise, Maybe lack of interest. Um, you don't have exact support. So I think I, I'll be really interested. Wow. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, so it looks that expertise is something very important. Okay, we have 15, just a little bit more. Okay, oh, 16. Okay, it looks like expertise. I guess I'm seeing myself on my website there, <laughs> I have to say. Although that was as well, which for me was more hurtful, was my lack actually of awareness, not to ask myself the question if I tell you the truth, that for me is, is still daunting. Okay, so thanks a lot for those of you. Uh, and I think expertise is one that actually, I've done this poll several times, comes often. So it's very interesting because it's the perfect, uh, actually, seaway for the last part of the talk. Okay. Um, which uh, actually is about our perception uh, about what we know about uh, creating ethical and inclusive experiences. Okay, 
So what's your part regenerating? You know, now we, we look at the business, now what you and I can do to regenerate the system. And one thing that comes often is, you know, I, I created this poll in, in a different way. Sometimes I ask people, okay, what is your degree of expertise creating inclusive uh, and um, experiences? Um, with very little exceptions, usually people are like, yeah, I have some experience and so on. But actually, I disagree. I, if you remember, you know, maybe some of you had care today for somebody in your home. Uh, some of you have created a Zoom meeting. Uh, we will maybe remember in some, you know, that's you, you have help, you know, um, with a birthday of a child. And if you remember, I'm sure you were doing a list, taking care of who eats what, what the allergies, uh, how the people will arrive to the venue, uh, remembering that this person doesn't like to be, uh, be near this other person when you did the, the table plan. And for Zoom, it's the same. Would the hour be convenient if people are in different um, uh, time zones, uh, does everybody have, um, uh, do everybody has received the link? So we are, we learn a lot during our lives to create inclusive experiences. So what's going wrong? Actually, the explanation may be very close to where you are in Cambridge. I'm a firm believer that the problem we have is scaling. We do have knowledge that we do in our lives about creating experiences that are inclusive and ethical. The problem is when we work, the scaling goes off. And there is a professor in Cambridge, uh, Professor Dunbar, that named a number, uh, the number uh, which is 150, the, num the numbers uh, number. And actually, he uh, posits that because we have some limitations because of uh, some cognitive uh, limitations. And one of them is the capability we have to create really meaningful relationships. And that limitation is around 150 people. So once we stretch that, then we really struggle. What's more, as maybe there is quite a lot of work regarding the size of um, the different groups in the military, but as well in agile, and how impacts actually the number. So even if I say here 150, this is the top, because as you add other things like, for example, people in the, uh, that you know are virtual, people that have different culture and so on. Actually, that number looks like it really reduces uh, incredibly. So basically, we we go to we begin to create uh, experiences that are not more any more ethical and inclusive when we actually lose that scaling. Okay. So this is where I think it's important, again, not to use recipes, but to have a systematic approach that does help us to go beyond that scaling problem. So in this framework, the idea is to prompt us to actually you know, go and stretch, broaden our vision. And the first thing, is really when we are creating an, a, an experience to think who is impacted by that experience. And all that we have learned when we talk about uh, lean start movement and so on is just to focus in the user. You just focus in the user and all will go well. But actually, you shouldn't just prioritize the user because the user is only part of people that are going to be impacted by your product. You will have unintended users, okay? People that may use your product and you know you didn't 
think about them, but still they will be impacted. Also, you, your, the, the family of your users, the environment of your users may as well be negatively impacted. So we do have to assume that responsibility. And I'm going to show you an example. This you have in both right and left, these are screenshots of uh, two websites that uh, give access to, uh, to uh, companies that sell uh, alcoholic beverage, okay? The one on the, on the right is very typical, all of them. So basically it asks you to add your date of birth, tells you to enjoy responsibly, but you know, they just let you see a little bit behind to entice you to go. I could only find one, I'm sure there are more, where actually, this is the one in the right, I, what is in black is actually um, the brand, okay? Where actually they, the, when you arrive to the website, what you have is, is a, a white screen. And of course they ask you for, for your uh, birth date, but actually not only tell you enjoy responsibly, they actually provide links in case you may want to uh, look a little bit further on what is alcohol, uh, drinking responsibly. So as you can see, yeah, you could say, oh, but my users are those that, you know, drink responsibly. Yeah, but you can go further in your product, you know, to make to make it more ethical if you broaden your um, your view. Next, how inclusive your product is, and when we say how inclusive, of course the default the default goes oh men, uh, men women, and then different ethnic backgrounds, which our mind just say like white, black, Asian, like, you know, very simplistic and um, more or less, and oh, people that uh, have um, disability, that's it. Actually, as I've mentioned, there is a lot more to it. And definitively we need to look at personal information and accessibility, but, for those in technology, I think it's very important that we understand actually that not everybody has the same access to technology. So for example, here you can see the top 10 internet users in the world last year. And, you know, look at India, Indonesia, Brazil, Nigeria, really Bangladesh in the top. But if you have been lucky enough to, to be there, I've been in several of those countries, actually people buy data and it's very, very expensive. Where they cannot use those very greedy apps. So a technology also is a way where we can include or exclude people. And then how ethical. And I'm not a philosopher, so don't expect from me a very nice, uh, you know, comprehensive um, definition. What I want, basically at the root, what we are wanting to address is, if somebody uses your product or your services, are they better off, are the same, or actually your product is making them worse? And I have a lot of examples. As I said, my name is very long. And for me, every time I try to do, to go into any FinTech app is unfortunately more or less the same experience. I can download them. I can open an account, but then I'm blocked inside with my passport and all the information given to them, but they are unable to process the fact that I have two surnames. Okay, so, and over and over is the same experience. Okay, so in that case, they may, their intention may be very good, but nobody saves me, you know, the two, three weeks of panic until this gets arranged. So, 
The most important part though is the next steps because you can use those, you know, the, those frameworks, but actually if you don't go through that discussion and decide at least one thing you can look closer, then it's a little bit useless, you know? So <clears throat> if you want to have something more concrete, and again, as I said, this is a framework. It's not, you won't have the magic bullet. You are the expert. But if you, you think you will benefit to have some kind of framework, uh, you are very welcome to go to my website. I have you know, a pilot of um, an online survey where basically it walks you through different um, inclusion and ethical questions. So a very quick demo. Here, uh, so you start by stating um, the product you are creating and then reflect not only what, who are your users, but also maybe those that are unintended users, as well as, as those that may be impacted uh, indirectly by the use of your product. Then you have a long list of uh, different categories about uh, around uh, uh, criteria for personal information, technology, as well as accessibility. Other list for ethical considerations. So for example, uh, do you have a clarity regarding the disclosure of personal data? Okay, uh, as again, is more, this is not a recipe, it's a tool for you to get to engage in discussions. And then you actually get prompted to really assess how well you know those populations, actually, your intended users, unintended users. Okay, and not only that, and I think this is very important, is the tool ask you to look at the diverse diversity of the creator team, because I think this is often the, the major block. We get a lot of market research, but when we look ourselves in, in the designing teams and, and uh, research teams, we all look alike. So it's, that is actually a great opportunity to see, okay, who is not here? And I have to say, um, I did a, a very small web app about you know, trying to quantify unpaid work uh, for um, professional women during COVID. And I saw the bias I had because I, was, I, I did a lot of work for the ethical part and the handling of the data, but I don't have children. So I had my idea of what was necessary. But I, I basically, you know, even if people talk to me, it was not the same that if I had somebody actually with that experience within the creator team. So when to use this kind of approach? Uh, sorry, and finally, the most important thing is, is actually to, to write, to, to say, okay, now that I have this discussion with my team, what I'm gonna do, who is gonna do it, why this is important, when needs to be done. Because again, it's about not so much how much you're gonna do in a job, but it's really a journey. So where to apply that? You can apply it, you know, is, is a general framework. But for example, uh, you could start by implementing this kind of uh, uh, workflow to look at inclusion and ethical considerations at the ideation stage. You can also do it, you know, and then continue doing the user research. Again, when you are testing, and I hopefully don't, you know, I think we all know what happens with, with photos, how they are processes, and how much important is actually to, to, uh, 
to test the products we create with diverse populations. And the other thing, and very important, is marketing. Because we have all seen, I personally see those um, websites where are aimed to everybody, but actually you have you know, this person that, you know, you, you can see, for example, a white male of, you know, 30 to 40 years old, all plastered in, in you know, in the website that says, you know, this is for, uh, this is actually already the website is telling you, you are not our user. Okay, so there are plenty of opportunities where, you know, that can benefit of a little bit you know, of, of thought about inclusion and ethics. So if, don't think about changing the world, but my suggestion is from doing this for several years is to start just by question. If somebody says, but why we are looking at inclusion? I'm like, why not? And then once you question it, you can challenge it. And then you can change it. And this is not mine. It comes from Stacey Copeland that, um, you know, uh, is a fantastic uh, role model and Commonwealth champion, super uh, welterweight. So uh, finally, uh, as takeaways, I think COVID is not the end of the world. Actually, I see COVID as you know, the opportunity to change from scarcity to abundance. And the first thing is to get rid of all these limiting beliefs that actually are not helpful. Then we, we need to get used to broaden our view, you know, uh, not only about users, but also, you know, con consider that everybody in our businesses are co-creators is not only R&D or product management. Okay, we are all creating experiences for customers. And in those experiences, we need to include how we can contribute also to communities, the governments, and, and when I say governments, I mention regulators and, and the planet. And finally, I have to say that, um, as you, some of you, that if you are in this journey, you will have realized this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And not, and this is why I, I keep saying, you know, let, let's shelve uh, recipes and, and just experiment, you know, and, and, and see how we can get the message across. Because I do think we, we could really uh, take advantage of, of the pandemic to, to have a very different and hopefully better world in, 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 in within the next 10 years. Okay, so this is it for me. I really appreciate those that, you know, that you've been a wonderful audience, you know, with the glitches we had at the very beginning. And um, I will really appreciate if you can use the reaction button and, just let me know, in, uh, you can use it to let me know that uh, if this uh, webinar has made you, you know, prompt um, some new thoughts or you will do something differently or maybe you will stop doing something. So like that, I will, you know, if, if this webinar has actually made you change something or you are going to change something, I'd love for you to use the reaction button so I, I know uh, the impact. Thanks again. I look forward to, to the Q&A. And uh, please do connect. Okay, uh, if you like it, but you didn't like, I'm very interested. And as well, if you have any ideas you want to collaborate, uh, I love to hear about you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. That's, uh, that's brilliant. Marvelous. Uh, fantastic. If you have questions, uh, there's no questions on the chat at the moment. Feel free to ask them as well. You can, uh, there are very there are so many of us on this evening. So if you want to just ask the question, please feel free to do that as well. 
Um, it was some real food for thought there. I kind of love the themes from that. I love this, that it's a lot of the things you talked about there, Patricia, are kind of a responsibility, but also a different route in to, you know, potentially different markets, different demographic graphics, et cetera. So it's some um, really interesting stuff. And I love the idea of co-creators within your own business as well. Oh, did we lose Patricia? Yes. Frozen out there. And there's me making a really astute point as well. At least I thought it was astute. Yeah. It hung on. Patricia was worried about her internet connection at the beginning. It held on all the way to the end and then dropped. So. Just the last minute. I think it, keep an eye on the uh, participants list if she's uh, uh, able to rejoin, maybe. Um, I was just about to add something on the on the questions. Yeah, so while we're waiting for uh, Patricia to rejoin and put another 50p in the broadband meter, any other questions or any kind of observations or reflections? Things that you've taken away that have kind of resonated with you, perhaps things you are doing in the company or anything you're thinking of doing after seeing uh, the presentation this evening? That would be cool to hear. So, well, I mean, for me, I think the inclusion and diversity part or just the ethics part is really challenging because although you know these, there's definite areas for improvement in the products that, that I look after, it's sometimes very hard or it's usually very hard to get those up the priority list in terms of all of the stakeholders and everybody else's changes that they want to see in, in, the, in the product. Um, and I've been sort of... Think, trying to think about a better way to kind of frame um, arguments towards kind of like we need to um, improve accessibility or we need, need to make it easier for people to, to log in or we need to make, um, uh, you know, make sure that everything works properly with screen reader, these kind of things. And there's, you know, there are standards that we're kind of legally obliged to be meeting and even sometimes those don't get met because of other kind of priorities. And, you know, one of the ideas that I've been like toying with is the idea of is some kind of often oh, find, I, uh, hello. I was often find myself fighting like a concept of technical debt. We have to focus on the technical debt before we can do anything about the kind of customer facing improvements. Or, and I was thinking, can we have a, is there a concept that I could use? I was thinking ethical debt or some kind of like something that would have the same power, you know, and the same status to stand up <laughs> against arguments around improving servers and things like that. I'm sorry, I got kicked out. I don't know if you got to finish. I got to see the end. I'm sorry, I don't, you know. Uh... We're back, so that's, yeah. that's great. We were um, starting starting the debate because we have such a marvelous crowd. So thank you, Liz. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I really, you know, it's been one after the other. So I really appreciate, uh, you know, you hang in there. You are really troopers. <laughs> Okay. I'm just interested in um, in Liz's point here that it's it's in Liz's experience being kind of tough sometimes to get those uh, features, if you like, or items that relate to inclusivity up the priority list. Um, I'm just wondering Liz, whether you've got any ideas about why that is, whether there's a kind of theme behind it, or whether it's mm -hmm. different for different situations. I think that it's. You know, for the part of inclusion, I think that one thing is actually for it's when you have privileges and I'm white and I've been in, in, in South America and, and see I was how privileged I was by default. I think it's, it's difficult to internalize. You know, you, I've never heard a developer say in the morning, you know, I woke up and I really want to do a sexist app. Okay, so people believe, we believe, as me went the website, we do believe we are doing the right thing. Okay, and everybody, so I think it goes really to the most primitive part of us when somebody tell us, can we do that inclusive? Because what we are hearing is you are excluding somebody, you are a bad person. 
you know? And that, it, it takes us like, wow, you know, I, I don't want that. I, I just, you know, it works uh, perfectly. So what I found it works is, as I show, is the business case, but not off the can. I've been in so many meetings where people says like, because McKinsey has this article, everybody, yeah, of course. What I've seen working is when you come with the case, when you say, okay, for example, my software, let's say, is um, uh, it, it's, uh, you cannot use a, a screen reader with that, okay? So it looks like a lot of people tell you, ah, oh, but engineers are, you know, we all, you know, apparently there is no engineer that is, uh, why we will have a person that is, that is blind want to use our software. <laughs> this is how they come to you. So I think that when you try and get really a case that you have a customer that asks you for that, that is, is really good. When you are able to see your competition doing it, then that hurts. It hurts when you have a key customer that is asking you that in the RFP, okay? I've seen it more and more, Unilever is doing it, for example. So when they do, they require, uh, and, and you know, they are companies that are actually asking you to go through that list, that helps uh, quite a lot. But in general, I think the challenge is when we try to map the case generally because I, I never seen the stick. If I don't, as I said, competition, a key customer uh, that is committed to it, uh, or when you see as with the e-traveling, when you say, this is what we have is our flat row uh, and, and this is the age of our customers. And this is what we are missing. So that would be a starting point. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really good point. I think it's got to, people have got to see, got to seem as important as everything else. People aren't just going to believe you if you just say it's the right thing to do. I suppose that's not enough, is it, sometimes? No. Mm. And the other thing is, there is a lot with the storytelling, sometimes too much. And I think what I realize is, and I think the Greeks used to do that, that, you know, to appeal everybody, you need to make not only numbers or not only passion or not only logic. You need to build a little bit in your presentation so you have, you know, on your case, the numbers, you start with the numbers, but then if you have a, a story of somebody that can appeal to somebody else, okay? So that there is the emotional part and then the logical part. So this is, I used to go only with the Italies. <laughs> And I have to say, you just appeal a narrow part of you, your audience. But, you know, I'd love to discuss, to continue the conversation. <laughs> okay. Marvellous. Thank you. Thanks for starting that discussion, Liz. Um, and we had a, a question from our own Farah here who says, I'm interested in the intersection excuse me, in corporate responsibility ethics versus the ethics of the products themselves. What do you think the relationship is? I see ethics at, at corporate level, I see it as a defense, defensive move. Okay, you have your lawyers, you do your training, and, you know, especially, for example, people are terrorized of GDPR now, <laughs> okay, because there is a fine. Uh, and this is what I see in, in, in the, in the um, when, when you go at corporate level, personally, is that we get this conversation only about mitigation and prevention. And I think that actually, to be honest, I think at the level of products, I see that because I've did it recently with somebody. I was trying, you know, to push for having an ethics committee. Okay. And everybody was like, wow, <laughs> you know, why? You know, we have lawyers. But actually, there was somebody that presented something. Okay. And then 
using that example, I said, you know, if this example really you use data, this is the kind of data you are going to add. And look at what happened to Google with the photos of the of the people. And look at how much money, you know. So I will say that in products for me, it goes, uh, the, the, the part that are more interested really is especially now in AI, in artificial intelligence. And I see it plays a different level, but I think what I see myself more successful is not going at, at the um, corporal level, but actually work, for example, with people that use the software internally, like pre-sales people, and said like, oh, I want to see your demo using, for example, this piece of artificial intelligence. And then again, through that example, work the scenario, the, what happens with the data, uh, and what happens if you know it's used, you know, and uh, and you know uh, it, how that especially um, you know endanger the life of somebody or make it more vulnerable. This is why looking. I find that working through the risks is better because you tell people, you know, this person is going to become more vulnerable. This person is and usually resonates more, but I do see them differently because I think is the conversation at corporate level so far, I find it about mitigation. And I think as a developers, we, we can bring that more to life by taking really a person, you know, through their journey and, and make understand something that is more um, uh, closer, you know, to, to our user. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so David's asked where he can find out more about um, the part you mentioned earlier about leadership versus communities. Uh, <clears throat> I have to say about um, leadership, I have to say that is a little bit, you know, is me being very fed up about all management articles about leadership, okay? And one thing that changed a lot for me, and I, I'm happy to send it to you via Slack. Um, I, be, I read a book about, I think it's called Uprising, and actually it goes through the, um, this is an uprise, uprising, I think. And actually what demystifies is our idea that it's just Dr. Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela, and they fix everything. Actually, they go through, you know, women's vote and so on. Is we can remember one person, but actually it, it took a lot of people. So this is where I I find that <clears throat> for me that that book actually changed the switch and said, you know, Patricia, there is a reason why you are fed up about leadership. And also, I have to say, now. I've been to several conferences, uh, women or you know, technology, and everything is about leadership and inclusive leadership and go on and on. So um, that, but I think to explore how you know, uh, the Arab Spring and so on have actually is a community effort does really come back to, to, to this, you know, um, difference between really who gets the credit and who does the deed. And, and also, I thought perhaps the appeal of stories as well that you mentioned earlier, that, that it, it's easier to weave a story in which there's a single hero than to try and account Absolutely. for the, the many thousands of people who, who really brought about the change. Absolutely. And I think that we have also this idea, again, of the purpose that if the leader, the, uh, you know, the, the, the corporate speak that says leaders drive change. Yes, they do drive change, but not only about what they say, also about what they do and the gap. And I think that leaving to the leader to be inclusive, this is not enough because the leader is surrounded by copies of the leader. Mm -hmm. So I think we have so much power if we 
understand as a community, you know, the part of our communities, how we actually historically are the ones making change. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay, Lourdes, there's a few, I think that was it for questions, I hope, that I haven't missed anyone, I don't think so. Uh, there are a few comments and links in the chat, so check those out before we finish. Mm -hmm. and I think Far is probably back to you to uh, take us home, I think. Sure. Right. Here we go. I'll just get the Zoom call up so I can see you all as well. Oh, no, there you are, all on the Zoom. You can see yourselves. There we go. So yes, thank you so much, Patricia, for a really thought-provoking uh, uh, talk today. And I'm sure we've all got uh, a lot to think about now. Um, so that's uh, really excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and great participation, as always, from our marvellous crowd today. Absolutely. And just a reminder that um, we are planning our March and April events at the moment. So uh, please join us on our new home on meetup.com slash Cambridge dash agile dash exchange. Uh, join the group and you will receive updates. We will be posting there very soon. And that's it. Thank you again, Patricia. That's really great. And thank you. Thank you, everybody. A yeah. pleasure. Yeah, you'll make CA what it is. Stay safe, join us on Slack, join us on Twitter, <laughs> and uh, we hope that uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Good